Romans chapter 11. And here in Romans chapter 11, we'll see uh, that the remnant of Israel, we'll talk about that, and then we go into the salvation is come to the Gentiles. The Gentiles warning, and at the end, restoration of Israel. Uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to start off with the psalm, Blessed Assurance, 480, 480, 480, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. A heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washing his blood. Cause this is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Cause this is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. I'm just watching and waiting, I'm looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Cause this is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Cause this is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. And we turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse number 1. I say then, have God caused, cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. In verse number 2 in Romans chapter 11, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew, wrote ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh an intersection to God against Israel, saying, in verse number 4 in Romans chapter 11, Lord, they have killed thy prophet and dig down thine altar, and I am left only, and they seek me, seek my life. We know the story of Elijah in that passage of scripture, how he had had a victory in um, causing Balaam to look bad, because God allow rain to come after he prayed three and a half years after he prayed that there would be no rain, prayed that there would be rain three and a half years later it came. And then it shows in James chapter 5 verse number 14 and following that that's the power of prayer. That's the power of prayer that we have and James compares this with, with the power of our prayer where it says the effective prayer in James chapter 5 verse number 16 and following of a righteous person of very much then he gives an example of how Elijah he prayed that wouldn't rain and prayed that did rain there's a lot of power in a Christian's life as they live this righteous life but here in uh, verse number 3 2 and following his people which he knew foreknew those with whom he was once intimately related this deed, this deals with nation, national and not individual destiny and is a strong argument to show that God has not terminated his program for Israel. He has not terminated his program for Israel. He has not terminated his program for us. His program for us is still the same. He is going to send his, his son into the world. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4, and he, he does that. The Bible is basically this picture. Um, where man sin and God is going to send a savior. He sends the savior, the savior comes, the savior dies on the cross, and then the savior is coming back again for those that love him, the, those that are obedient to, uh, to him. So uh, he, he sends his son, his son comes. Now, this also gives us the assurance that God is true to his word. 
God cannot lie, Tyler chapter 1, verse number 2. Uh, in hope of eternal life, God cannot lie. That if God say it shall happen, it shall happen. If God tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you, we must believe that. If God tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19, that he will supply all our needs uh, through riches in Christ Jesus, and we must believe that. And these are just other examples of how God, he did exactly what he was going to say. You know, my, our parents used to say, God may not be on time. How do they put it? Uh, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Yeah. Have you found that true in your life? And this is what we see here. So in verses number seven and following, we see that the election, the chosen one, these are the believing Israelites like Paul who have believed and are being saved today. So we... Of course, and then you go, you go with Romans chapter 8. Uh, we read that earlier, verses number 28 and following, you know, where, where it says, you know, God knows who his elect is. He, he knows uh, who's going to obey the gospel. And, you know, you have some religion saying that's a select few. Uh, you've, been, you've been selected before you were born and all this kind of thing. No, but God wished everybody to be saved. If that was true, I might have well not even try to be a good Christian. I'm, I, I should not even be a Christian if that's the case because I'm not going to make it in anyway. <laughs> but, but we make a choice. We make a choice. Faith come of how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So it's up to us to make that decision. God does not, even from the beginning, did not make them robots. He made them free moral agents. He makes us free moral agents. So we have a choice and we can make decisions and that's a wonderful thing. Now, now uh, people that can't make decisions for themselves are people that are locked up in prison, in jail. They can't make decisions for themselves. You, you know, some say, well, I don't want to be locked up in prison. Some people are locked up in, in prison spiritually as we speak now. And, and, and they're letting Satan make decisions for them. They're following Satan and not following God. See, you have freedom in the Lord. You have freedom in the Lord, but yet you still must be disciplined, and yet you still must have the fruit of the Spirit. And Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 and following, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, gentleness, all those things must be a part of your life. Yeah, you're free, and you're free indeed in the Lord, but yet, because he has set you free, but uh, you're free to be a servant and do his blessed will. Notice what it goes on to say in verse number 4 in Romans chapter 11, but what says the answer of God unto him? I have, re re I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to, to the image of Baal. In other, in other words, God, God is saying, uh, yeah, Elijah, you seem like, you feel like you're the only righteous one and you did a lot of work for me and everything else, but I want you to know, and it's true with me and everybody, God does not need me, me I need God. God did not need Elijah. Elijah needed God. And all that he had done. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, remember when Jezebel was running after him, he just wanted to die. He just wanted to die. You know, that's the ups and downs in life like that. You know, that's a valley, that's a mountain peak, and that's a valley, and you must balance that out. And God told him what you need to do. And this is what we need to do in our lives sometimes. Just, just, just back off. He said you need to just get sleep and eat. And God provided food for him, and also he got sleep. He got some rest. Sometimes it's too much for the journey because, you know, we have not gotten rest. You know, when you're traveling, uh, driving a long period of time, and, and, and there's the sad part is you have to go to a funeral, for example, and, and you have to be there at a certain time, and you don't have time to pull over and rest. You don't have time to stop for a long period of time. Um, and, and we, we're that way in life sometimes. We, we put all these demands on ourselves and we don't have time to pull, pull aside. Uh, but we need to sometimes just pull aside Jesus did, didn't he? He was still away. He was still away. He would get away from the crowd and get some rest. I want you to notice what it says here in verse, look at verse number five, Romans chapter 11, verse number five. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God would always, always leave a remnant. He'll always leave a remnant. Uh, even as we are here now in this particular building, 
uh, years ago when they started up, I'm told and I talked to people that grew up uh, here in this area and grew up at this congregation, they said that the building was packed and, uh, of course, the balcony up there was packed and the whole works. And, um, and there are some congregations in, in this time period, uh, which is like 60 years, that have shut down. But thank God this congregation has not shut down. But God would always leave a remnant. Yeah. What is a remnant? A remnant is like a root when you cut down a tree. It, it would always sprout up. And see, see that's, that's the foundation of, uh, of the gospel and foundation of our lives. You know, um, what the Bible says, we're to be what? Rooted and grounded. Colossians 1, remember Colossians 1, verse 21 and 5, rooted and grounded in the word of God. We're, if we stay rooted and grounded, God will use us as a remnant, and, we're, and, and the church will always stand. You know, the pandemic it, it wiped a lot of churches out, if you will. Uh, but, you know, we're thankful that we're still standing, and not only standing, but standing strong. Amen. You know, one thing to stand, but one stand, well, another thing to stand strong, remember, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 11 and following, Paul makes this statement. He said, Alexander the coffee smith did me much harm. You know, uh, Paul is a Christian, and, and you don't always get treated right. That's part of our sermon uh, this morning as uh, David and Saul, the difference in them, and then at, at the point of David being anointed king, you know, he had to, he went through a lot of struggles, and we can't tell people that you're not going to go through struggles in life. So you're not always going to be treated right. But Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 11 and following, he said, he said, Alexander the carpet smith did me much harm. And he said, no man stood with me. Sometimes you're standing strong or standing alone. He said, no man stood with me. He, then, 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 then he gives us this beautiful note there. He says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 and following, he says, but the Lord stood with me. I don't know about you, but I submit to you this morning, if the Lord's standing with you, you're going to be all right. Amen. Paul says, I do all things through Christ which strengthen me, Philippians 4, verse number 13. He said, but the Lord stood with me, and not only did the Lord stand with him, because a person can stand with you, but not, not help you. And he said, not only did the Lord stand with me, but the Lord strengthened me. Not only did the Lord strengthen him, the Bible says, but the Lord... Paul said, the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the lion. The Lord stood with him. The Lord strengthened him. The Lord delivered him. And, 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 and that's, that's what we find in uh, El Elijah's situation here. Uh, the Lord was there for him. And, and there were some turbulent times in his life, but the Lord was still there. And sometimes we get in turbulent times. We have to wait until our change comes. Isn't that what Job said? He said, though he slay me, yet I trust in him. Job said, I'm going to wait until my change come. Uh, you know, and, and we're not talking about when you buy something and, and, and then the cashier give you the change back. <laughs> right, Brother Barry? We're talking about waiting until your change come. Because that song says change is going to come. But we have to be strong and wait till our chains come. Notice what he goes on to say in um, verse, number, verse number six, in Romans chapter 11, verse number six. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. In other words, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, but since we're saved by grace, what motivates us? We're motivated the fact that we're saved by grace and we want to work. We want to work for the Lord. So I want to be a worker for the Lord. We want to work for the Lord. We're saved by grace. I want to, we want to work for the Lord. That should motivate us. Look at verse number 7 in Romans chapter 11, verse number 7. What then? Israel has not attained that which he seeketh for, but the election has attained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written in verse number 8 in Romans chapter 11, according as it is written, God has given, God has given them the spirit of slumber. And that's in verse number 8, the spirit of slumber. Spirit of stupor. Remember what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses number 
uh, 11 and following says that, you know, the slothful, he talks, God, Paul talks about the slothful, and, and that matter of fact, that's in the next chapter over. Let's go to the next chapter over. You're going to tiptoe in the next chapter over right quick in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Uh, look at verse, uh, look, at, look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. Romans chapter 12. Be kindly affected one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful. There it is, right? Romans chapter 12, verse number 11. Not slothful, the word is used back there also. Not slothful in what? Business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And, um, and so verse number 11 means uh, we're to be fervent in spirit, boiling over. That's what fervent means, boiling over. And, Rom and James, I mentioned earlier, in James chapter 5, verse number 16, uh, that, God, that uh, God hears the righteous cry that, you know, uh, be fervent, you know, the fervent prayer of a righteous person of very much fervent. Fervent here means boiling over, you know, just compassionate, boiling over. So he says uh, in verse number 11, not slothful in business. In other words, lagging in diligence. Lagging in diligence. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Without faith and impossible, please God, he that cometh to God must believe that he exists and he is a warder. Notice this now. He's a rewarder of them that what diligently seek him. See, we must not be lagging in diligence when it comes to the Lord. I see so many people can be diligent about everything else. Be passionate about things. Be passionate. It's all right. Be passionate about football, baseball. Uh, they're, they're passionate about, I, I know a lady, she's passionate about tennis. And that's fine. But should that translate even more when it comes to being passionate for the Lord? Amen. So what, what, is it, what is he saying in Romans chapter 12, verse number 11? Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving who? Serving the Lord. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Just boiling over. Just excited. Just excited about serving the Lord. To th this evening, 4 o'clock, we'll be going to hear one of my favorite preachers, Brother Dan uh, Jenkins, uh, there at Father's Park Church of Christ at 4 o'clock. We invite everybody to come. He's been preaching here since Friday, and this is his last day to preach. He's talking about leadership. And um, to be fervent in spirit, diligent, and he is diligent and fervent in spirit. He's a wonderful example of that. Uh, and this is what Paul is saying, you know, you know, have that zeal for God, you know, put God first and be fervent in spirit. Where are we in that in, in our lives when we examine our lives? You know, what, what, what are we putting first? See, God wants to be first in our lives. And in, in Luke chapter 14, verse number 23 and following, you know, we have to, every day of our lives, we have to take up our car, we have to deny ourselves and follow him. That's what fervent in the spirit is, is, is denying ourselves every day. He says daily, right? And put him first, denying ourselves and following him daily. And, and we'll see this morning in lesson how, uh, there can be a struggle in our lives. It can be a struggle in our marriage when you decide to follow Jesus. It could be a struggle in a job. It could be a struggle um, in other places of your life. Because when you put God first in your life, you let your light shine. You know, with the saw of the earth, and you let light shine. And when, you, when light shines in darkness, it, it exposes people. And, and so that's, that's what we're to be a Christian. Notice what it says in in Romans chapter 11, once again, look at Romans chapter 11. Um, look at verse, verse number 7. What then? Israel has not attained that which he seeketh for, but the election has attained it, and the rest were blinded. They were blinded. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, the spirit of slumber. In verse number 8, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear until this day. They're blinded. Remember, God was sending a strong delusion so they would believe a lie. If you believe it, you keep rejecting God and doing something so much. Um, they're blinded. And we saw 
we see in 2 Corinthians 4, remember, if our gospel be hid in verse number 1 and following, it is hid to those that are lost. And the God of this word, Satan, has blinded, there it is, right, the minds of the people. He has blinded the minds of the people. So, so what the, the church responsibility is to bring the light to the world. Bring the light, the gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. We're to bring the light. Uh, and so even parables, remember, and, and Luke chapter 8, remember, uh, sometimes Jesus, he would tell those parables not for the enemy to understand, only for his disciples. And later he would explain them to his, his disciples. And some of those parables meant to uh, cover up the truth from, from the world because sometimes the world will gobble it up. You know, you don't feed your whip. Here it goes now. Matthew chapter 10, you, you do not feed your per, per, uh, pearls to swines. You know, be careful about that. You know, uh, everybody would not receive the word of God. You, you, sometimes you shake your feet up, dust off your feet. Look at verse number 9. And David in Romans chapter 11, verse number 9, and David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let, let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. So, so here we see Paul quotes from David in Psalm 69, verse 22 and 23. This is where he's quoting from, to show that David anticipated that search as experience would be Israel's. God is working according to his eternal plan, and God has an eternal plan, doesn't he? He has an eternal plan for us. He had an eternal plan for them. And, and that's what we need to be concerned about, God's eternal plan. Um, and notice what he goes on to say, the hardening of Israel will reach its height in the middle of a tribulation. Scripture anticipates the condition of Israel as it is today. God is not surprised, neither should we be. If it were otherwise, we should be troubled because we, we wish that everybody be saved. We, we do. And, and um, some say, well, that person is too hard-headed to be saved. No, let God have has that call. Let him have that call because you don't know what God can do to a person's heart. But your job is to live the best life you can. Your job is to teach the word because faith comes by here and here by word of God. And God's word is more powerful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 than any what? Two as a sword. Listen to what, what, what we go on to read in verse number 11. In Romans chapter uh, 11, verse number 11. Um, I say then, have they stumbled that they shall fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to, be provoked, to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the dimensioning of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And, and so he, he breaks this down, uh, how they stomach that they should fall. Uh, this is to ask whether Israel has stumbled so badly that they have fallen completely out of God's program. Is there no future for Israel? Paul, he asks this question, right? And uh, Paul shows that Israel's apparent rejection is not permanent because of God's purpose for Israel, rejection and the purpose, promise of his restoration. Now, remember, even with David, we'll talk a little bit about David this morning. we we'll talk about his heart. But David's sin and his rejection of God's righteousness at one point you would think that, oh, no, this is the end of the story for you, buddy. This is the end of the story. God's not going to use you anymore. You know, for the men in poor pits today, uh, David would be cast out. And every time they see him, they, they, they would treat him like the lepers. Remember the priest and the, uh, the priest and the Levite, when they saw that person with leprosy, one, he went on the other side of the road, <laughs> the other side of the street, and, and, and he didn't look at him. Bible says in the other one, at least he looked at him. And it will be like that for preachers today that was in David's situation. People wouldn't even look at it. You know, but one, I want you to notice this now. This is true in our lives. One mistake does not define you. If I read somewhere, 
that all have sinned, not y'all have sinned, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if one mistake defined us, I'm told that the average person, if the average person sins three times a day, that's a thousand in a year. So you have a lot of, you have a thousand sins defined in you in one year if you let that, but the blood of Jesus Christ just washes away like nothing happened. I, sometimes I don't think we, we realize the beauty of that. Sometimes we need to just sit back and think about that. And there's no cleansing power like that. And, and, and we love Clorox, and Clorox can do some things. <laughs> but uh, can't nobody do it like Jesus. Man. Your sins are washed completely away. You know how in the, um, those FBI movies and forensics and all that where uh, a person kills someone in the garage and they wipe the blood up in the garage floor and they see stuff flat on the wall and then they start getting some Clorox and everything wash, washing it away and then they, um, they realize they drag the person inside the house. Y'all see these movies and it's not necessary movies. These, this is true, right? And then they, they clean up the house, they clean up the floor, then they, then, but they come with the, the forensic uh, items and they they put a little dab here, a little dab. They said, this is blood. This blood on the wall. <laughs> you know, you, and you did all you could. You know, you thought Clorox would do it. They told you Clorox would do it. But even when it comes to our sins, your, your, your blood won't do it. Yeah. It's the blood of Jesus that yeah. would do it. The only thing would do it. What will wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Clorox won't do it. Won't do it. Matter of fact, remember in John chapter 13, when with Jesus, he, he loved them to the end in verse number one. He loved them to the end. You know, and he was going to be betrayed pretty soon, but he, he makes the point that he loved them to the end. He came from the Father. He loved them to the end. And then this is what the Bible says in verse number two and following in John chapter 13. It said Jesus shows him what servanthood is all about. He, he take out his outer garments. I want you to know that now, just his outer garments. Back then they had uh, undergarments and outer garments. He takes off his outer garments and put the towel around him, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Wash their feet. Back then, you know, we don't have to do that because, you know, we, we wear socks and shoes, and, and the roads are not dusted like they were then, like, in Barbara's day, in my day, when we visit our grandparents, and the, the roads were not paved, and the road was dusty. They're not like that anymore. You wash your car, and, obviously, and you're creeping down that dirt road, you wash your car, you think you're safe, and somebody come by you real fast, and all that dust go all over your car. Well, are saying with the feet, they, 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 would, they would walk, and, uh, and sandals, and their feet were dirty, and the number one thing you will want when you go to a person's house is just good hospitality. You want somebody to wash your feet. Almost like when you, Jesus said, you give one, one of my servants in Matthew chapter 10 uh, a cup of water, you should not lose your reward. In other words, you know, you're helping my servant. Back then, washing feet and giving water was so important. So because that's what they needed at the time. You know? Uh, and so, okay, Jesus says, okay, I wash your feet. Peter said, no, 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 don't wash my feet, Lord. I, I, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. And, and then uh, Jesus said, no, if I don't wash your feet, you won't be clean. You won't be clean. This is what, this is what he says. He said, well, Lord, go ahead and wash my whole body. <laughs> Jesus is saying, no, it's not about washing your whole body. It's a ceremonial thing. You know, even, you know, back then, you know, you all have this thing that we always, people say from a child, they say, it's in the Bible, cleanliness is next to godliness. No, what, what, what God, next to godliness, living a righteous life, that's what it is. Yeah. Some of the cleanest people in the world, some of the dirtiest people in the world in their heart. Yeah. It's, it, it, we need to be, clean. don't get me wrong. But, but Jesus, okay, he, say, he says in John chapter 13, the disciples said, no, no, Lord, since I won't be clean unless you wash my feet, just why you at it? Just go ahead and wash. I'm so, I'm so sinful. Wash my whole body. And Jesus said, no, I just need to wash your feet. Now, you see, ceremonial clean, cleansing that the Jews would have, they would have a, uh, 
they have water over here in the water pot, and then uh, some would think in order to get that person clean, uh, they had to wash the whole body. No, it was it was ceremonial cleanness. You know, if they would just put a little water here. You know, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. And you notice anyway, no matter what kind of soap you have, thou, owl, a child soap. Y'all heard child soap? I have a niece. But no matter, no matter what soap you have, you can never get yourself totally clean. What can wash away our, uh, all the sins in our lives? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. I want you to notice in, in Romans chapter 11, look at Romans chapter 11, the Gentiles are warned, though. Gentiles are warned in Romans chapter 11, uh, verse number 13 and following. For I say to you, Gentiles, in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Okay, how is Paul the apostle of the Gentiles? Well, that's what God made him in Acts chapter 9, verse number 15 and following. God made him the apostles of the Gentiles. Why, why is this important? Because Peter was the apostle of the Jews. Remember, Peter... He actually preached the gospel. He was given the keys to the kingdom in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 and following. And Peter used those keys in Acts chapter 2. Remember when over 3,000 souls were saved when he preached that gospel sermon. And now it was a Gentile church, a Jewish church at that point. And then now, in Acts chapter 10, the Jew, Gentiles are baptized, Cornelius house baptized, and now it is a Jewish church at this point. Now they're all one in Christ. But Paul was apostle to the Gentiles. You know what that tells me? That God had an assignment and he knew who to use for every assignment that he had. Now, okay, if you're called, we're called by the gospel. We're all called by the gospel. We're all called for that assignment. Uh, uh, first, temp, first Thessalonians chapter uh, uh, 2, verse number 14, 13 and following. We're all called by the gospel, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some say, well, how were you called? Did you hear something at night? Uh, Barry, Barry, I'm calling. No, but Bob Powell didn't hear that. He, 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 he heard the word of God. Faith come out here, hear by the word of God. We're all called by the same thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so, so when, he, when, when, when uh, Paul, look at Acts chapter 9, verse number 15. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse number 15. The, the Bible says, and this is um, as, as Paul, let's, let's go to verse number 11 because and because uh, Paul, he, he um, of course, uh, God deals with him. Uh, he's on the road to Damascus to uh, persecute his, God's people. Why persecute thy men, verse number 8, and, and then verse number 5, and says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou what? Persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse number 10, verse number 6, and he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And that's the question that we're asking each person that is listening this morning, what God will have you to do. What God will have you to do to be saved. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. See, God used earthen vessels. He used earthen vessels to tell the story. Even in Acts chapter 10, uh, Cornelius was told that, you know, he, he got the vision, you know, while he was on the rooftop, and why couldn't the angel just go ahead and tell him what to do then? No, God used earthen vessels, so God used, he sends Peter to tell him what to do. He sends you to tell people what to do to be saved. That's who he sends. No, notice, notice what it goes on to say. He, he says in, in verse number 6 in Acts chapter 9, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, would thou have, what would thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into this city, and it shall be told, did y'all hear that? It shall be told thee what thou must do. We must be on the telling end. In John chapter 6, verse number 44 and 45, the Bible says, They all be what? Taught of God. T-A-U-G-H-T. In other words, the Christianity is a teaching religion. Some, you know, denomination people that they all will be felt. You'll feel God coming into your heart. You'll feel it. 
No, in Acts chapter 2, verse number 36 and following, the Bible says, when they heard this, faith come how? By hearing, when they heard this, they were what? Pricked to their hearts. And said, men and brethren, what shall we do? There it goes, right? They answer the same question as Paul. What shall we do to be saved? And then just what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse number 36 and following, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the forgiveness of sin. Now, Paul wants to know what, they, what he must do. And the Bible says in verse number 6 in Acts chapter 9, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. See, we can't fall down on the job. No matter how, 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 how discouraged you are, how, 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 how depressed you are, you, you can't fall down on the job. I know one of my roughest times in my life, when I went to Abilene Christian University, it was a rough time in my life. And, and I realized that I, I couldn't be slacking on the job. I, I must be about God's business. Remember we talked about be slow, do not be slow in business? And even up there, studying and praying with people, baptized several people up there and brought men, restored men. men but I could have just got in the corner somewhere and said, uh, uh, I'm falling, I can't get up. No, it's not about her but more. It's about all that he has invested in us. He has invested so much in each of us. And we, we should be happy to give his investment back. Well done, that good and faithful servant. Y'all remember that one? Been faithful a few things. I make you rude over a minute. Not that it was hard. Not that it was easy. Well done. It's something that we must have done in order for God to say well done. That good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. I make you ruler over many. Here goes, enter, here goes, Sister Gamma, enter to the joy of the Lord. Oh, what a wonderful saying, right? Yeah. So some of you out there now, you want to give up and give in. Don't give up and give in. Just keep on going, and God will give you strength. Verse number 7 in Acts chapter 9, And the men which journeyed with him, they stood speechless, hearing their voice, but seeing no man. See, sometimes God knows how to specifically call you out. They heard a voice. And the voice, they didn't understand. We see that later in Acts chapter 22. They didn't understand that voice. And they saw nobody. They were, they were trembling. They were scared. I would be scared too, wouldn't you? You know, Fred Sanford, you always look up and talk about he's coming home. Y'all remember that? <laughs> I don't know, did he hear a voice or what? Oh, we need something coming home, you know. Uh, don't don't want to hear. <laughs> Just think it had really heard a voice. <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> and the men that were joining with him stood speechless to hear that voice, but seeing no man, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open. That's beautiful. I think just part there. I know our time is almost up, but we need to part this for a second. You know what the gospel does? It opens our eyes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11 and following, the Bible says the, the, the corner man could not understand, the worldly man could not understand the things of God. Why? Because our eyes are not open. It is only until you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sin. They would always get on Brother Kiba about, man, all you preach is baptism. All you preach is baptism. He said, you must preach baptism because their eyes would not be open until they're baptized. Yeah. Bible says, Bible says, and Saul arose from earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But that led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight. That's a long time to be without sight, not knowing whether or not you're going to get your sight back. And neither did he eat nor drink. Three days without eating or drinking, you, you blind. Can you imagine that? Like my grandfather would say, you don't know what's not going on. Uh, like, like that singer would say, what's going on? My grand, grandfather would say, you don't know what's going on. Verse number 10, in, in Acts chapter 9, and there was a certain disciple at the master's name, Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Thank God to be here for God. And when, you know, when he, when he called on me, I would answer. Remember that song? And my robe is right. 
uh, I will answer. And the Lord said unto him in verse number 11, Arise and go into the street which is called the street which is called Scrape, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul and Taurus, Tar, Tar, uh, for behold, he prayeth. Now he's praying. He's praying. And has seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. I know that's a wonderful thing that Ananias came in, allow him to see his sight. Then Ananias answers, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy servant, thy saints at Jerusalem. In other words, uh, Ananias said, this is a bad man. I know he's a bad man. I, I, I know what he did. I, I, I know what he did. In, in Acts chapter 7, you know, he held the coats of those that stoned Stephen, the, the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know what this man is capable of. And you want me to go to him? You want me to go to him? Notice this. And there he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a, here goes now, a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great thing he must uh -uh, suffer for my name's sake. Hold, hold it now. We as Christians, when we get into the gospel of Jesus Christ, you mean to tell me we're going to go through some suffering? Yes, you are. We'll talk about this, that this morning in our sermon. That's when it really started. That's when David's suffering started, when, when, when God had Samuel to anoint him. That's when it started. That's when our suffering started, when we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, because Satan is coming after us like never before. And then, as we come to a close this morning, I got to shed it down. In verse number 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, brother, here it goes now, uh, the Lord, even Jesus, there appeared unto thee in the way as thou cometh, has sent me, that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know he was happy to hear that. Uh, you're talking about, he, 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 was, he was happy to know that Ananias was coming in down a doctor. A doctor can do something, but he can't do everything. And immediately that fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight for with, and that, what did he do now? He arose and was what? Sprinkled. He arose, and he would just dab a little water on his head, christen. He arose, and they just dipped him just a little bit. No, the Bible said he arose and he was baptized, buried in the water of grave of baptism. And when he had received meat and was strengthened, he needed some meat to strengthen him. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached, here it goes now, Christ in the synagogue that he is. What is he, Paul? He is the son of God. He is the Son of God. That's exactly in Acts chapter 8, verse number 37, that Philip joined himself with the unit, and he said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He confessed. He made that confession, and he baptized that unit with the water grave of baptism. This morning, I hope, trust, and pray that you've been buried in the water grave of baptism in the right faith, that you would not tear it. Like, uh, you know, he said, why, why tear it there, Paul? <laughs> and we see this in that, that same story repeated three times in the book of Acts, in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. In Acts 22, it says, why tear it there, Paul? Arise and be baptized. Paul says, I was not disobedient. Uh, why, why tear it there, Paul? Arise and be baptized. And then I love this part. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly calling. Are you disobedient this morning to the heavenly calling? Are you disobedient as to what God has told you to do? I hope you're not. I hope you do like Paul. 
stop. Supreme says stop in the name of love. We say stop in the name of Jesus. And that'll be the name you'll be calling on once you obey the gospel. Day in and day out. It's a wonderful name. No other name in which we must be saving that which is given and, and, and given unto man under heaven, that, and that is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of our lives. Remember what Paul says, I love this part in Colossians chapter 3. He said, and Christ who is our life. He is our life. We're going to close at this time. I've given you a step of baptism. We mentioned much about it. I don't have to say anything else about it. Just do it. Nike didn't just come up with that. That came up. That's in the Bible. <laughs> Wherever you see, where my servant, remember, in John chapter 2, uh, Jesus' mother said, whatever my, uh, my son tell you to do, just do it. We're going to be closing with a word of prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you yet again for another chance for us to gather here with the saints to hear another portion of your word in our Bible studies. Please bring a special blessing to Brother Moore as he leads us through our Bible studies and through our worship services later this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask that you forgive any sins we committed to own and unknown against you to where you could hear these prayers and supplications. Heavenly Father, we also ask that you look on, on the saints that haven't gotten here to this building yet, that are on their way very at this very moment to be here to help us worship you in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we ask that everything that we do beyond this point would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight because we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, Father, and that is to worship you in spirit and truth. We ask, we ask that you just continue to bless us and be with us, Father, as we go further. We ask these, might, these blessings in your mighty son's name, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. Amen. We're, we're so thankful for each, pre, each person that, that has tuned in. We don't take that for granted. I want to give a shout-out to my brother-in-law, Reuben Moore, all the way in Arkansas. That's so faithfully. Look at our podcast and sermon. Uh, we love him so much. It's my wife's baby brother, Reuben Moore, and others that we, we see you in um, can't acknowledge everybody, but my hometown and all over. Thank you so much. We love you so much. Thank you so much. Please tune in next Sunday. Next few minutes, we'll be in our worship service. God looks at the heart. Part two, God looks at the heart. Thank you so much.